Welcome. Welcome to our discussion on the atmosphere for Earth science. Uh, this is part one. And uh, today uh, we're going to cover various topics and processes within the atmosphere. We'll look at the layers of the atmosphere and uh, how each atmospheric layer is uh, identified by temperature changes. Uh, we'll move into the electromagnetic radiation scale and uh, explore um, what that scale means and uh, how our uh, atmosphere uh, influences the radiation coming from the sun, which is the EEM or electromagnetic scale. Uh, we'll spend some time in this discussion looking at the role of water vapor. And so we'll explore the concept of humidity and relative humidity. We'll look at the greenhouse effect. Uh, we'll discuss and explore the adiabatic processes uh, which incorporate the role of water vapor. And ultimately, we'll look at how the adiabatic processes uh, produces uh, cloud formation. Then at the very end part of the discussion, uh, we'll put it all together and uh, we'll look at why, for example, Bakersfield has the particular type of uh, annual uh, climate where it's uh, typically very hot in the summertime and very uh, cool in the winter time. And we really don't get an in-between fall or spring. Uh, we may get something for about two weeks, and then it's either gonna be hot, like I said, in the summer or a cold uh, into winter time. So that's kind of where we're headed with the, um, with the discussion. And uh, I think this time around for this particular lecture in, in, in the atmosphere, you should be able to follow pretty closely the worksheet questions uh, that I've developed that uh, should correlate pretty well uh, with the slides. So this first, first uh, picture uh, that you're looking at, the first slide is a slide um, showing the Hurricane Katrina. And you can see where Katrina is uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And I think it's like one day before it makes its way onto the Louisiana um, uh, Peninsula, the, the Louisiana coast. So let's go ahead then and take a look at uh, what is an atmosphere. And we're gonna find later when we get into the solar system that uh, many planets have uh, atmospheres. And of course, the one we're particularly interested in in this discussion, of course, is our own, the Earth's atmosphere. And typically an atmosphere, rec or, um, typically an atmosphere um, represents a very thin layer of gas that covers the entire Earth in this case. And I like to look at the atmosphere as a sea of gases. Um, it behaves much like water, but we can't see it. Um, it uh, has uh, motions within the atmosphere, which we're gonna talk about as we look at some of these processes. Um, the, our atmosphere, of course, lets us breathe. We're gonna find that our atmosphere keeps us uh, uh, very uh, cool um, and uh, keeps us temperatures, which is habitable uh, to humans and other organisms on the Earth. Uh, and we're gonna find that our atmosphere is actually very thin. It's approximately 65 miles uh, thick, uh, which means if you were to drive from, uh, let's say the grapevine, uh, and you uh, drove all the way up to Delano, for example, that span of distance, you basically have driven through, um, uh, through our atmosphere. And if it wasn't for um, processes within our atmosphere, average temperatures on our Earth would be at minus 15 degrees. So, you know, our atmosphere can also serve um, as a very thin envelope of gases uh, or uh, a blanket, if you will. If we look at the atmosphere in terms of its composition, the atmosphere certainly represents, again, a mixture of gases. And if you kind of break these gases down and you look at the diagram uh, to your right here, 
you find that the atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen, 21% uh, oxygen, and about a little less than 1% argon. And so um, if you look over here, it says other 1%. Well, there's our import, there are some important components to our atmosphere that drives a lot of the processes that take place within the atmosphere that really come under this other or 1%. And if you look over here, uh, we have water vapor, which water vapor anywhere uh, in our atmosphere can range between 1% to 4%. And if you're in the equatorial zones, or evaporation is a lot higher, then that percentage is a lot higher. If you're in the polar areas of the earth and the percentages of water vapor would be a lot lower. Another type of uh, compound that we find in our atmosphere, which is part of the greenhouse gases, we call carbon dioxide. And it represents about 0.035% of the atmosphere. Some other uh, types of um, components found in the atmosphere is helium, methane, and you look down here and you can see uh, krypton, nitrous oxide, uh, hydrogen, and of course, ozone, which we'll spend some time a little bit later in the discussion talking a little about ozone. And I think for the San Joaquin Valley and us in living in Bakersfield, I also put in there that we certainly have a concentration or amount of dust and pollen particles uh, within, our, um, within our atmosphere. But certainly uh, oxygen, 21%. And nitrogen uh, taking up 78% of, um, of our atmosphere. So if we now look at this slide, we can actually take our atmosphere and our atmosphere can be divided up into a series of layers. And we're going to look at the four main types of layers um, that um, um, compose our atmosphere. And each layer is basically defined by the temperature change. So let's go through and just look at the four layers and then we'll go back and we'll look at how uh, temperature varies within each one of the layers. So if we start on the surface of the earth where we live down here, uh, the first layer uh, becomes a layer called the troposphere. And uh, the troposphere um, is about uh, 11, uh, 11 miles um, high. And again, after we do this slide, we'll look at some characteristics of, of each one of the layers. We have the troposphere, then overlying the troposphere, uh, we have the stratosphere, and overlying the stratosphere, we have the mesosphere, and overlying and above the mesosphere, we finally have the thermosphere. Now in each one of these layers, um, it's defined by a temperature change, and that is governed by, on the graph, this line right here. If you follow my arrow, this arrow represents a temperature change that takes place. And so what we need to do, like any other graph, is we need to kind of look at how that temperature changes uh, with respect to each one of the atmospheric layers. And so if you look along uh, the x-axis down here, uh, this represents the temperature change in Celsius. And then on the y-axis, this represents the altitude. So if we follow the line, so this line that we're looking at represents temperature change. And so just not even looking at numbers, but just looking at what the line represents, the temperature line, we can see that in the troposphere, as you uh, increase in altitude, the temperature decreases. So the temperature gets colder and colder and colder. And then when it enters the stratosphere, the temperature gets warmer and warmer. So the temperature increases in the stratosphere. But what one needs to be careful of is that even though the temperature line shows the temperature increasing in the stratosphere, it's really not that warm. Because in fact, if you get to the very top part of the stratosphere, where the temperature is going to be the highest, and you extrapolate a line down, you find that it is really only zero degrees. That's the maximum uh, warmth that the uh, stratosphere gets to is zero degrees, which is still very, very cold. As we move from the stratosphere to the mesosphere, um, temperature goes way down, and you can see how the temperature really decreases and drops down. In fact, the mesosphere represents the coldest atmospheric layer, and you're probably looking at around, if you look at the graph, probably around minus 90 degrees. Then as you uh, enter the thermosphere, you can see where the temperature line uh, increases and it gets very hot. Now, one must be careful uh, by looking at this line because it's really uh, 
kind of indicates to you that if you go to the thermo thermosphere, that you'd be, you'd be very, 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 very hot. And in fact, that's not true. If you went to the thermosphere, you'd actually still be very, very cold. Because later on, when we get to the next discussion in winds and atmospheric pressure, uh, we're going to find that by the time you reach the thermosphere, the atmospheric pressure is very, very low because the atmosphere is very, very, very thin. So in the troposphere, I'm sorry, in the thermosphere where it is the uh, atmospheric pressure is the lowest, the molecules are spread out and there's lots of spaces between the uh, various uh, molecules that compose the atmosphere and therefore heat transfer is less. So in reality, the individual molecules may heat up and be very hot according to this temperature line. But in reality, if you were in the thermosphere, it'd be very, very cold because it's very, very thin. So your job as earth science students um, and to be educated is to learn troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere, learn them in order backwards and forward, but also be able to associate the temperature uh, uh, variation between each one of the layers. And again, I've indicated that with the arrows. And so you can see where temperature up is here, temperature's down, temperature's up, and temperature's down. And so your job then is to become an expert at the relationship between temperature and the layers of the atmosphere. So let's go through now and look at um, some typical characteristics uh, that define each one of the atmospheric later, layers uh, besides looking at uh, temperature. So if you look at the troposphere, and the first thing you see in this particular slide of the troposphere is you see that this is a combination of many, many clouds. And in fact, we're going to find out that one of the uh, uh, dominant characteristics of the troposphere is, is that it's uh, turbulent, all storm activity take place within the troposphere, uh, which is basically the production of clouds. So kind of going down the bullet list of characteristics of the troposphere, again, represents the lowest layer of the atmosphere. Temperature decreases with altitude. And so we, um, we kind of uh, looked at that with the previous slide. Uh, temperature in uh, the troposphere can be measured as what we call the environmental uh, temperature lapse rate, the ETL. Uh, which is which is um, which is going to be about uh, uh, um, 6.4 degrees uh, Celsius per every 1,000 meters of, of increase, and so every time you go up 1,000 meters, we lose about 6.4 degrees. All storm and turbulent activity takes place within the troposphere. So again, this is where you're going to see the clouds, the thunder clouds, the storms, the wind. Uh, the turbulent activities, and so forth. So lots of things uh, go on uh, in the um, troposphere uh, that we experience when we go outside uh, every day. Uh, the average thickness is about 12 kilometers from the surface. Uh, thickest in the equatorial zone, about 16 kilometers thinnest in the polar regions. And then finally, it's responsible for what we call the greenhouse effect. And later on uh, in the discussion, we'll uh, cover the process of the greenhouse effect. But again, all taking place in the troposphere. So we'll take a look at this slide and think, wow, look at all the clouds, look at all the turbulent activity, uh, that uh, uh, more um, uh, uh, atmospheric processes take place in the troposphere. And we're now going to compare that to the stratosphere. So the next slide is going to show you a picture of the stratosphere. And wow. What a difference. Stratosphere looks a lot more calm, looks a lot more, uh, uh, it certainly isn't uh, got a lot of uh, uh, thick clouds. So the stratosphere um, layer lies between the troposphere uh, and the mesosphere. Uh, the stratosphere contains strong persistent winds uh, that typically will blow from west to east. And so one uh, particular type of wind I can think of as the jet stream. Uh, which has uh, uh, speeds in excess of 200 uh, miles per hour. And so uh, th those uh, typical types of winds uh, aloft, if you will, um, you know, uh, move in the upper part of the atmosphere, stratosphere. Uh, temperature increases um, as altitude increases. And the stratosphere is known um, uh, for its uh, containment, 
or uh, has the ozone layer. And we'll spend some time here in a few minutes talking about what ozone is and what the purpose of ozone is. Uh, the stratosphere heats up because uh, the ozone absorbs uh, the sun's radiation. And again, we'll uh, talk on that in terms of uh, how um, important that is for organisms living on Earth. In fact, let's look at that. So uh, here is um, the ozone layer. And again, the ozone layer, um, I'm just gonna put all the stuff on here. Let me just put everything on here. Whoops. So the ozone layer um, is a type of um, uh, compound that has three, um, three oxygens uh, bonded together. And the ozone um, is a type of material then um, that uh, exists in the stratosphere and protects us from the harmful uh, ultraviolet radiation. And so later on, we'll be talking about the electromagnetic scale and we'll look at this shortwave energy, you know, uh, regarded as uh, UV radiation. And what the ozone does for us uh, in the stratosphere is it absorbs 97% of UV radiation. And how important is that? Well, if it absorbs 97% of UV radiation, that means that of that, of that 97, uh, we receive about 3% of the UV uh, radiation that gets down to the surface of the Earth. And the question I have is how many have ever experienced a sunburn? Well, if you're raising your hand and you say yes, which most of us have, uh, we've only experienced uh, getting penetrated by 3% of the ultraviolet radiation that caused that sunburn. Can you imagine um, getting um, um, hit with the entire 100% of ultraviolet radiation? I mean, if that, was, if that was the case, organisms on Earth wouldn't even exist and uh, we would certainly be uh, crispy critters. And so again, uh, the ozone layer is concentrated uh, in the upper uh, stratosphere. So what this little animation is showing you is it's showing you how the ozone then makes that absorption or absorbs 97% of the sun's radiation. And later we're gonna find that ultraviolet radiation is what we call short wave energy, which is high enough energy that when it's uh, entered into the atmosphere, and you watch the animation, it'll have a tendency to take an O2 uh, uh, oxygen molecule, and that energy is enough, that UV energy is enough to break the O2 into molecular oxygen, and that molecular oxygen then combines with another um, um, uh, oxygen molecule to make ozone, to, to bond the three oxygens together. And again, this is a continuous cycle that takes place up in the stratosphere. And every time, for example, go back to our diagram here, every time this molecular oxygen is bombarded by ultraviolet radiation, it breaks apart. And at that point, it's being absorbed. So at that point, the UV light is being absorbed. And so again, 97% of it um, is absorbed in the stratosphere and we just get the 3%. So ozone is pretty important. Let's move up now to the mesosphere. And again, the mesosphere is the layer between the thermosphere and the stratosphere, 30 to 50 miles above the Earth. And we know from our little diagram that temperature decreases with altitude, and the mesosphere contains the coldest temperatures uh, within um, the atmosphere of about minus 90 degrees. This particular slide uh, that you can see in the background is a uh, shot or a picture of sun rising um, if you're in the space shuttle. And so if you're kind of riding in the space shuttle, you're seeing the curvature of the Earth, the sun is rising, uh, the light is being bent, or I could say the word refracted uh, within each one of the atmospheric um, layers. And so it kind of delineates each one of the layers. And so if you kind of look at the orange layer down here, you see the little cumulus clouds forming, that would be the troposphere. Um, the yellow layer would represent the stratosphere, and then the white area here would represent the mesosphere, and then of course above that um, would be the thermosphere. And finally, we reach the thermosphere, and uh, just to put the thermosphere in perspective, I uh, used this picture then of the space shuttle uh, being on the very outside of space, looking down at the most upper layer of, of the uh, atmosphere, which is a thermosphere. 
first layer to be heated by the sun. And that's why when you looked at that uh, uh, previous diagram, looked at the temperature line, it showed the thermosphere being very hot. But, mem but remember, uh, we, we recall that the atmosphere is very thin. So it's really each individual molecule in the thermosphere that's hot, but not the entire, uh, not the entire thermosphere layer itself. Uppermost layer of the atmosphere, temperature increases with altitude, and uh, a lot of controversy amongst scientists is always where is the upper boundary of the thermosphere. And typically that upper boundary has been uh, looked at at about 65 miles from the, from the surface of the earth. And it's basically where um, you know, the gases of the earth kind of merge with the gases of space. Okay, so let's spend a little time now talking about the sun's energy and how the sun's energy radiates uh, into our atmosphere and how our atmosphere, um, um, how our atmosphere deals with the electromagnetic radiation from the, uh, from the sun. So if you look at the very top of the slide, it says, what is incoming solar radiation? Well, that's another term for sunlight. And folks were tired of saying incoming solar radiation. So instead, we now use this term called insolation. And don't get this word confused with insolation, but the word is pronounced insolation. And again, it's just another word for energy or um, light coming off the sun. So again, it represents earth energy the earth receives from the sun. It travels at 300,000 kilometers per second, which is 186,000 miles per second. That's, that's the speed of light. And how fast is 186,000 miles per second? Well, if one says 1,001, light will already travel 186,000 miles. Or one can say, if you say 1,001, uh, light has traveled seven times around the Earth. And typically um, from physics, we've learned that uh, light typically travels in a wave motion. And so if you were ever to be able to stop light at 100, you know, stop light to a dead stop, you would find that it would be a vibration between an electric field and a magnetic field, and it would be composed of waves. So sun rays then comprise the electromagnetic spectrum. And when we say spectrum, we're talking about a group of light. And so if we look at this scale down here, this is known as the electromagnetic spectrum or sometimes referred to as the EM scale. And the scale is uh, a scale that shows the division of light rays. And the way we're gonna look at the division of light rays is we're gonna look at a concept in the EM scale called wavelength. And wavelength, if you follow my arrow, is the measurement or the distance from a top of a wave to the next top of the wave. And so this would constitute one wavelength. If I come over here, this would constitute a wavelength. If I come over here, this would constitute a wavelength. So in the EM spectrum, uh, we're looking at a, a group of wavelengths. So I want you to take a look at this EM scale and take a look at the bottom of the chart where it says the electromagnetic spectrum. And I want you to ask yourself what's happening to the wavelengths as we move from this part of the uh, electromagnetic scale, EM scale, and as we move down to the very end of the electromagnetic scale. So take a look at those wavelengths and what's happening in terms of their measurement. And what you should see is that the wavelengths are actually getting smaller from this point all the way to this point. And because of the smaller wavelengths, it gives different characteristics to each um, um, part of the spectrum or each part of the light. So for example, if we look at what we call uh, long wavelengths, so these wavelengths would be the longer wavelengths, these wavelengths, if, if, if organisms, including humans, come in contact with them, uh, they're considered not harmful. And in fact, longer wavelengths uh, 
take up what we call radio waves. And then uh, in between here, this is a little bit older version of electromagnetic scale, uh, would be uh, microwaves and then infrared waves, which are basically represents like a type of heat wave. And so those represent the not harmful uh, longer type waves, again, that uh, uh, humans uh, that we can exist in, that they don't bother us. Then uh, this little area right here where my arrow is, this represents what we call the visible light spectrum. And when we say the visible light spectrum, this is a very narrow band of wavelengths uh, that can be divided up into the colors Roy G. Biv. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. This very narrow band of wavelengths is detectable by the human eye. So when we see color, we're seeing wavelengths coming off the material that we're looking at, uh, either in red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, or violet. So this is a very narrow uh, band of wavelengths that the human eye can see. So for example, if there was a material, um, some type of paint, some type of material that was absorbing the violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, and orange wavelengths, our eyes would interpret that wavelength as red. We would, we would see the wavelength coming off of that material and we would call it the color red. Now, from my understanding, uh, folks who are colorblind, their eyes um, have difficulty seeing some of the different wavelengths within this visible light spectrum. So for example, if they can't see um, you know, the longer wavelengths of, of red, orange, and yellow, then um, that would look more or less black and white to their eyes as opposed to you know, the colors green, blue, indigo, and violet. In fact, a quick little story um, that I have is when I was a, a high school instructor at Delano High School, we had a biology instructor uh, who was actually very colorblind, and he was colorblind in the longer wavelengths of the visible light spectrum, which means uh, he couldn't see red, orange, yellow, or green. And the colors that uh, he could barely see were just uh, blue, indigo, and violet. So certainly one of the questions I had for him was, well, how do you drive? I mean, how do you know when it's a red light or a green light? And he indicated that he knows uh, if it's a red light, if the uh, light at the signal is just a little bit brighter than the two lights below that. And he knows to go when the light on the bottom of the signal is a little bit brighter than the two lights above it. And so the first, you know, logical, uh, logical, uh, thing that came to my mind was I'm not driving with you because I'm certainly not going to take a chance if he can't see a, a green uh, or a red light. And then I remember one day uh, the biology instructor uh, came to school uh, kind of dressed like the town clown. I mean, he had uh, purples and whites and yellows and, and he's just walking down the hallway that like there's no problem. And uh, I found out uh, uh, later that his wife uh, picks out uh, clothes for him because he can't color coordinate. So when he kind of looked like the uh, town clown, I asked him if his uh, wife was mad at him, because that would be a great way uh, for someone to get back at somebody that's colorblind. So now if we move then from the visible light spectrum, and we move now to where the wavelengths are getting shorter and shorter, uh, now we're uh, moving um, to what we call harmful type uh, waves that are harmful to organisms, including us humans. And we refer to this as short wave energy. And why it's harmful is because if you look at the wavelengths, they're a lot shorter. And you have to realize that this entire spectrum is traveling at 186,000 miles per second. So the shorter the wavelengths are, the more energy of impact that that wavelength is going to uh, uh, give a, 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 a material. And so again, as it gets shorter and shorter, there's more energy behind its punch, if you will. Because remember, the, the whole entire spectrum is moving at 186,000 miles per second. So included in these very harmful short type waves in the electromagnetic spectrum would be ultraviolet radiation. Okay, so that's responsible for our sunburns. And if you get enough of ultraviolet radiation, it could be uh, skin cancer. 
uh, that's responsible for x-rays. And certainly we've all had x-rays in our life. And I certainly do notice that when uh, you take an x-ray, for example, at the dentist, uh, they put this big lead apron on you because they're trying to avoid uh, striking your soft tissues uh, with, with x-ray uh, radiation. And then there are gamma rays, which are highly, highly uh, uh, harmful and powerful because they're the shortest wave on the end of the spectrum. And uh, they're highly, um, uh, they're, they're, again, they're, they're, they're uh, uh, very harmful. So the sun delivers to the earth this entire spectrum. So as the sun radiates uh, to the uh, earth and, and, and the um, light of the sun penetrates through the earth's atmosphere, the earth delivers the entire spectrum, a little bit of gamma rays, x-rays, certainly ultraviolet rays. Uh, certainly we get the visible light spectrum and then infrared and radio waves. So our question is, uh, how does then the atmosphere um, handle uh, this insulation uh, from the sun? And this particular slide here kind of gives you the idea of what's going to happen to um, the insulation as it enters our atmosphere. So again, what we have is the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. And we're going to allow insulation, which represents the entire EM scale, and we're going to allow the sun uh, to deliver um, that, that radiation onto the Earth. So let's start with um, uh, the, tro the thermosphere. And of course, what enters the thermosphere is the entire spectrum. And so purposely in this diagram, I've, I've tried to make little short waves here. So basically what we're getting here is the entire spectrum from long wave to short wave energy. And fortunately, the thermosphere and the mesosphere will absorb the x-rays and it will absorb um, the gamma rays and it will begin to start absorbing some of the ultraviolet radiation. So we can thank our upper atmosphere uh, for absorbing and taking in most of the shortwave energy before it even gets down to us in the troposphere. Then it will move through the mesosphere and it will move down to the stratosphere and the remainder of the ultraviolet radiation then is um, absorbed through the ozone layer. So now we have 97% of the um, uh, radiation, um, again, absorbed in the ozone. And then what's left for us in terms of being living in the troposphere is that uh, we will uh, get the longer wave energy. Uh, so we'll de definitely be the infrared, uh, certainly the visible light and radio type waves. And then we'll get a little about 3% of um, the uh, ultraviolet radiation. And so again, we can kind of thank our atmosphere uh, for the absorption processes uh, that take place, um, especially absorbing the um, shorter wavelengths in the upper part of the atmosphere. 